Hello and welcome. This is Wildens for Create a Learning Site, the place that helps you to go deeper in your understanding of the Bible. This issue is the third and last in a series on N.T. Wright's colossal book on Paul, Paul and the Faithfulness of God. And this time I'm going to look at the big picture of Paul's theology as Wright summarizes it uh, in the book in three words. Care to guess which three words that might be? Three words. Generations of theologians have wrestled their brains out with Paul's thought. And now N.T. Wright thinks he can summarize all of this in just three words. Okay, maybe you're skeptical, but let's give him a chance. He thinks he can do it, even though Ironically, it takes him 1,700 pages to accomplish it. This is how Wright goes about it. Uh, his book on Paul begins with a description of um, Paul's world. Uh, no, that should be plural, Paul's worlds, uh, which include uh, the Jewish world of faith, the Greek world of philosophy, uh, and then the pagan world of religion and cults uh, and the Roman world of empire. So that's actually Paul's world summarized in four words. Wright then continues with a, a breakdown of Paul's worldview and then he presents an analysis of Paul's theology organized around three words. Uh, he offers one excruciatingly long chapter for each of these three words. It might perhaps be possible to summarize the theology of Paul in three words, but that doesn't mean there's nothing more to say after that. Uh, Wright's 1700 pages prove the point. So what are those three words? They are, first of all, monotheism, and then election, and third and last eschatology now it's not entirely correct to say that Paul's theology can be summarized in these three words uh, these three actually summarize jewish faith at the time of jesus this is the shortest possible summary of what jews believed at the time that they can also be used to sum up Paul's theology demonstrates that, as N.T. Wright doesn't tire of saying, Paul remained a deeply Jewish thinker. However, uh, in order to adequately summarize Paul's new take on this core Jewish theology, one thing needs to be added. So it's going to be three words plus a little something extra. Uh, and that, uh, that, is, uh, that is this. Paul reimagined and redefined each of these three uh, in the light of the Christ event. That had just taken place. What I'll do next is quickly summarize the Jewish perspective on these three terms and then move on to Paul's redefinition of them. So first monotheism, there is only one God. Well, that was the most foundational conviction of the vast majority of Jews living in the first century does not necessarily mean that other gods were entirely fictional beings. Uh, they were often considered to be a front or cover for demonic powers, but it does mean that whatever else they might be, they were certainly not gods. This foundation stone of Jewish faith finds expression in the equally foundational confession of faith that Jews pray every day, even even nowadays, uh, 
the Shema, named after its first word in uh, Hebrew, Hear, Shema Yisrael. Uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. A familiar verse uh, from Deuteronomy. And here's the monotheism. The Lord is one. There is one Lord. Uh, by the way, by referring to uh, your God, the Lord, your God, the Shema implies the next foundation stone of Israel's faith, election. Yahweh was Israel's God because he had chosen them uh, to be his people. If you know anything about the Old Testament, it is bound to include this, that Israel was God's people that he had led out of the house of slavery, Egypt, uh, to make it his special possession out of all the nations of the earth. The Jewish Bible is the story of this special relationship. And then eschatology, in case you're not familiar with this word, uh, in theology it denotes the study of final events, the end, and the ultimate destiny of everything, because the end uh, is also the beginning. And it was typically Jewish to not only have an understanding of ultimate purpose, uh, life is not meaningless or cyclical, but also to consider it central to the faith. We find this eschatology most clearly expressed in the prophets, of course. Yahweh will come and set the world right. First century Jewish faith was full of hope and expectation. So what did Paul do with all this? Since I will focus on his renewed and transformed monotheism, I will present his take in reverse order, starting with eschatology. Part of the way Israel's eschatology is redefined, not just by Paul, but really throughout the entire New Testament, uh, is something you're uh, most likely familiar with, uh, a significant element of fulfillment is introduced centered on Jesus. At the same time there remain significant elements that are not yet fulfilled. God's righteous rule over creation has been inaugurated and not yet completed. Jesus had been raised from the dead but no one else. Uh, and then there's uh, the day of the Lord uh, in, in the Old Testament, uh, the day of Yahweh, which becomes the day of Christ, and it is part of what still awaits its fulfillment, part of the not yet. It should not have come as a surprise, but to many Jews it did, uh, that this salvation and God's purpose for the cosmos uh, actually includes all nations, not just Israel, it's for the whole world. Indeed, it concerns all of creation, reconciled to God through Christ and now waiting for its liberation from decay. Now, there's much more to it than this, enough to fill that very long chapter I referred to earlier, but this is at the core. election redefined. This point is more controversial. For one, it brings to mind the subject of predestination that I won't deal with here. Uh, but for another, uh, the church for a long time took this to mean that it had simply replaced Israel in the divine plan. In other words, God had drawn a completely new circle to mark God's people. Well, that's not quite how Paul puts it, but neither will it do to simply state Israel 
is God's people, as if the coming of Jesus makes no difference for who's in the circle. When it comes to election, this is something we need to take into consideration. Israel had been chosen, yes, but it had not been chosen for its own sake, but for a task, for a mission. The whole point of Abraham's calling was to be the counterpart and answer to Adam, to undo humanity's failure. As the Old Testament makes clear, Israel failed to fulfill that mission because it was itself part of the Adamic humanity. Adam lived as much in every Israelite as in the rest of us, so Israel could not itself be the solution. It would still be part of the process of bringing the solution about by bringing the Savior into the world, who then took over the mission. In more than one way, Jesus took the place of Israel. He fulfilled Israel's mission. Uh, this has consequences for that category, uh, the people of God or descendants of Abraham. Uh, what happens is that the circle is redrawn much more widely. The Gentile believers are included in the election of Israel. As the circle is redrawn around Christ, not Torah, the criterion for inclusion seems to change as well. Or maybe it's simply an opening of the circle. Membership is no longer based on works of the law, but on faith in Jesus. One way this redefined election shows is that Paul and other New Testament writers do not hesitate to take titles and promises specifically given to Israel in the Old Testament and apply them to Gentile believers as well. Uh, even more radical is Paul's breathtaking reimagining of the Jewish God. Here is Paul's response to the Corinthian logic uh, that there is no God but one, and therefore idols do not exist, and there can be no harm in visiting an idol's temple. Well, sounds logical, Paul doesn't quite agree. Um, this, this is his response. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Now, I won't go into the faulty logic of the Corinthians at this point and how Paul presents a counter-argument uh, to theirs, uh, arguing against feasting in temples uh, and so forth. Um, rather, I would like to point out the echoes of the Shema, that foundational Jewish confession of faith in the one God, both in the Corinthian claim and in Paul's response. Here it is. There is no God but one. And then again, for us, there is one God, the Father, who is, uh, from whom, who is the source and the purpose of our existence. Uh, and then there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, who is through whom are all things and through whom we exist, uh, who is the means and mediator of creation and the sustainer of our existence. Now uh, keep in mind that Lord is um, what Jews at the time would have read wherever their Bible included the divine name Yahweh, since they did not want to uh, pronounce that name. And in, in, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, uh, 
Lord appears wherever the divine name is included in the Hebrew text. So what Paul has done is he has rephrased the Shema to make room in it for the one Lord, Jesus, right next to God the Father. The fitting response in the Shema to love God has been transformed here in for whom we exist. This is only one example of Paul's amazingly high view of Jesus. And it should be emphasized that Paul and the early Christians remained staunch monotheists. Had someone accused Paul of B or tree theism, he would no doubt have responded with an adamant denial, by no means. So when did this belief first emerge? And how did Paul and others come up with such a seemingly counterintuitive understanding of the one God? It used to be common in critical scholarship to think that the belief that Jesus was divine was a late development. It was not what the earliest Christians, or Jews, had believed. It only developed after Christianity spread to pagan areas outside of Israel, where the idea of a human becoming God, even if not an everyday occurrence, was at least thinkable. In this view, Jesus, or rather Christian beliefs about him, only gradually evolved from a Jewish Messiah to the second person of the Trinity. At its worst, Jesus' divine status becomes an invention of the Church, certainly not something Jesus had actually believed about himself. Nowadays, it is more acceptable, again, to argue that a so-called high Christology existed quite early. This is not to say that we find Trinitarian theology in the early Church, but we do find something that understandably enabled its development and, in fact, implied it. Let me give a few more examples of this early and high view of Jesus. First, there is the confession of Jesus as Lord. Uh, I already pointed out uh, this title sort of implies the divine name Yahweh, or at least in the Septuagint, it's used over and over again to refer to God, uh, where his name uh, appears in the Hebrew text. In the New Testament, it usually refers to Jesus. Then there's Old Testament quotations that refer to God in the original context, not to the Messiah, but are nevertheless used to say something about Jesus like Romans 10, verse 13, and Philippians 2, verse 10 and 11. Now, Jesus was believed to be present with his people, the way Yahweh in the Old Testament had been present with Israel. And then Jesus was revered as Lord in a way that would be totally inappropriate for any other human. Uh, he was prayed to, he was worshipped, most obviously in the book of Revelation, which is a late book, but also as early as Acts chapter 7 verse 59 and 60 uh, and some other places. Already in the earliest New Testament documents, we find God and Jesus side by side as together the source of grace and peace, for instance, which surely could come only from God himself. Now, when it comes to circumcision, Paul has to argue at length against Gentile believers uh, receiving it. But when it comes to seeing Jesus as co-equal with God, there seems to be no need to argue. As N.T. Wright points out, and as the examples here illustrate, he can simply take this point for granted. It was not contested. 
So how did the early Christians come to such a startling understanding of Jesus? The answer is not that Jesus had told them he was God's son. Now, he had indeed told them this, of course, but it would not in and of itself have led the disciples to see him as the second person of the Trinity or even as divine. It was first and foremost a messianic title. Uh, going back to 2 Samuel 7 and perhaps Psalm 2. Uh, and besides, uh, Israel itself in the Old Testament is called God's Son. So claiming this title did not necessarily make Jesus God. It did not flow out of the personification of wisdom that we find in the book of Proverbs. It did not develop from a, a differentiation between God and his word, uh, personifying this word into Jesus. Both ideas were picked up later to give words to the nature of Jesus, but this came as part of a reflection after the fact had already been established uh, <coughs> that Jesus should be seen in this light. Uh, Colossians 1, we find wisdom in creation parallels, and in John 1, we find Jesus as the Logos, the Word of God. But it does not appear that these two uh, ideas, these two later reflections on Jesus were the original trigger. Now, we should Keep in mind, M.T. Wright points out, uh, that for first century Jews and Christians alike, monotheism was not uh, metaphysical or philosophical speculation. About the inner constitution of God, God in the abstract, so to say, or God as a supreme being. It was first and foremost um, a concrete and practical, so uh, concrete and practical belief that one God, not many, would decide where things would go. The Jewish story was always a story about the God they had encountered and hoped to encounter again in real life. It was all about the one God who had manifested himself repeatedly in the concrete events of history. Now, this is a more flexible doctrine, as doctrines go, than, for instance, Islamic monotheism or the unmoved mover of Aristotle. But none of this explains the radical revision of God embraced by the early Christians. N.T. Wright argues that three things had to come together for the early Christians to begin to see Jesus as included in the divine identity. Now, God had promised that he would do certain things, and the early Christians believed Jesus had done them. This included salvation, the second exodus, and the return of Yahweh to Zion. But the point is, God had not simply done them through Jesus. God had fulfilled his promise as Jesus. So what did this tell the early Christians about who Jesus was? Perhaps the best way to illustrate this from the Bible is to take these verses from Isaiah 40, a voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, Yahweh, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And what's going to happen? The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Say to the cities of Judah, 
Behold your God. Look, here he is. Now, these verses introduce Isaiah's vision of coming salvation that's then described in more detail in chapters 40 through 66. Remarkably, they're quoted at the beginning of each of the four Gospels. So how did this happen? How did God appear in the cities of Judah? You know the answer. So three things had to come together. Number one, God fulfilled his promise. He appeared, he returned, not simply through Jesus, but as Jesus. Number two is the vindication of Jesus through the resurrection. Uh, Jesus had claimed to be the Messiah. His crucifixion seemed to prove that very obviously he was not. But then came the resurrection and it, it was followed by Jesus' ascension into heaven. Uh, this served to vindicate Jesus. Obviously he was the Messiah after all and he was now Lord of all. And then there's point three, uh, the experience of Jesus in prayer and worship. The, the disciples continue to experience Jesus as being present with them in a special and powerful way. And this it could only be understood as the divine presence that was with them. And probably this experience of Jesus as the exalted Lord in prayer and worship did more than anything else to establish the identity of Jesus as God. Jews who would not worship any other God even if their lives were at stake found themselves worshiping Jesus. They couldn't help themselves. That says it all. Mono worship Jesus. That's a bumper sticker for you. Suddenly, Old Testament scriptures and statements made by Jesus could be understood in an entirely different light. He was indeed the Son of God in the sense that neither David nor Solomon nor any other human king had ever been or could be. He was the divine wisdom and the Word made flesh. It makes perfect sense that these convinced monotheists did not hesitate to see Jesus as in some way part of God, as included in the divine identity, as Wright puts it. After everything Jesus had done and everything that had happened to him, most notably the resurrection, there could not be any doubt about it. Now, Interestingly, something similar happened in the disciples' understanding of the Divine Spirit. The Old Testament prophets had promised that God would uh, rebuild the temple and would return to dwell in it. This had now happened, but in a startlingly unexpected way. The new temple was made of people indwelled by the Divine Spirit. So again, the way God was present with his people now was as the Spirit of God, and the Spirit was at the same time also the Spirit of God's Son and the Spirit of the Messiah. At this point, even though no one is saying Trinity, they sure are implying it. The early Christians especially Paul had to rethink their monotheism around the divine identity of both Jesus and the Spirit of God. The evidence of their experience with Jesus and of God was so overwhelming that it could not be any other way. There was 
one Lord, one Spirit, one God and Father of all. God was one, God was Jesus, and God was the Spirit, and vice versa. It's a breathtaking revision leading not to a different God, but to a God known much more deeply. So there's Paul for you, in three words. Monotheism, election, eschatology. A partnership of the Father, Jesus, and the Divine Spirit, working for and through his people toward his ultimate purpose.